Today we are discussing Marxism, what it is. Now, if you believe that Marxism is something economic, it means you have not read any of Marx. And that is what we're going to take away from this lecture today, is precisely what is Marxism. Again, if you believe it is something to do with economics, it means that you have not read Marx, and that is a response only from a person who has not read Marx. Rather than economic theory, it is actually a theory of man. And this is actually according to the contemporaries of Marx. This is not my opinion. This is not my estimation or my analysis. This is according to scholars of Marx, and specifically scholars that came right after uh, the fall of Marx, specifically his economic models, failure of his economic models. These people are not trivial people. These people are hyper intelligent. They know exactly what they're talking about. These people are people like Eric Fromm or Robert C. Tucker or Georg Lukács or Antonio Gramsci. Right? These people are not trivial people. These guys are at the forefront of an of, inte of intellectualism. And these people define Marx as not anything to do with economics. In fact, it has everything to do with the theory of man. The bulk of this lecture, though, will be discussing nothing to do with legislation, but everything to do with why it is, in fact, a religion for factual reasons, and really what kind of religion it is, in my estimation, and in the estimation of a good deal of non-trivial scholars. Marxism is a kind of esoteric Gnostic religion, and we'll be uh, discussing that. But I think it also becomes important at this point, at least, beginning of this lecture, to define religion. Because without defining religion, we're not going to be able to characterize Marx as religion. Also, everybody that I'll be mentioning in this lecture are not trivial people. And I have to keep on saying that the people, the people that I will be mentioning are not trivial people. They are eminent scholars in the field. This is not up for debate. Anyways, the point where we are now, before we really even get into Marxist faith, is defining religion itself. And in finding, in finding religion, one must consider the broader context of its usage and history for the, re for, for the reason that uh, religion is in fact a modern concept. And it is a modern concept manifesting from the impinging contrast of the Western is over ought dichotomy. The climate, as you will see in the West, is all about what is, right? There is not much concern in terms of epistemology with, uh, with values. The East is completely concerned with values. And uh, this, is a, this is just a matter of fact. This is the is over ought climate that I'm talking about. But because religion predates the Western ethos, it is universal to all interpretations that religion does not concern knowledge. That is epistemology. That is what the dichotomy I've been talking about. The is over ought. Religion has never concerned in its history, in terms of what it means and what its definition is, it has never concerned with what is. So what is religion, really? Well, it is indeed the case that scholars have failed to agree on specific terms, but despite this, they are nonetheless unanimous in their convictions that there are universal features that hold true about religion regardless of and across all interpretational variations. And I will put forth that it is when these universals are met that religion is thus defined. So, the universals are threefold. So no matter where you go, no matter who you talk to in terms of being an anthropologist and a PhD, they all believe that religion has three universal uh, facts. And these facts are independent of um, interpretational variations. And there's going to be interpretational variations, sure. There are no interpre interpretational variations in terms of these universals. The first universal is ontology. Ontology. So something religious needs to at least, at the first point, need to have an ontology, which is a theory of man in the world, or a theory of being, right? 
It's not a religion if it just has that. Again, these universals, all three need to be met for it to be called a religion. Ontology is the first. The second is teleology. Teleology is the purpose of phenomena, usually in an arrow sense trajectory, the purpose of phenomena, where we are going, right? When you assign purpose to phenomena and its place and its trajectory, that's teleology. So you have a theory of man in the world and you have the purpose of phenomena. You can call it the purpose of history, you can call it, you know, it's phenomena. Whether it be a historical phenomena, it's phenomena. The second, or the third uh, universal is actually the most interesting because it arises from the first two, and that is axiology. So when you synthesize ontology and teleology, in other words, the theory of man and the universe, and the purpose of, you could say, history or a phenomena, when you synthesize when you synthesize those, you necessarily arrive at axiology, which are, which is duties of conscience. So duties of conscience necessarily arise from this ontology teleology synthesis. These are the three universals in religion. All religions, doesn't matter what kind of religion it is, they all have an ontology, they all have a teleology, and they all have an axiology. Therefore, they have an axiology. Axiology, again, is what uh, manifests from the, from the synthesis of those two. So a religion is any belief system that satisfies this criteria. And for this reason, and for this reason alone, Marxism is a religion. We will be getting into detail about that very shortly. So in defining religion, there must only be a worldview that synthesizes an ontology of man, which is a theory of man in the world, with a teleology of history, or in other words, a purpose of phenomena. This thus gives rise to duties of conscience, in other words, an axiology. And this is according to Geertz, who is a famous anthropologist. But what's most important um, is that the unfolding process of this triad is not contingent on the epistemological defaults of reason, deduction, inference, or correspondence. So if you have an ontology uh, of man, you have a theory of man in the world, and you have a teleology of history, you have, a, you have the purpose of phenomena and its place and where it's going, right? That necessarily arises, that there necessarily arises duties of conscience, which is axiology. So ontology, teleology, axiology. This unfolding process, this process in its completion, is not contingent on epistemological defaults, such as reason, logic, deduction, correspondence. This is important. That this is, this is the end in which one may be able to de define religion. If it does depend on epistemological defaults, and again, this is again, this is the split between the Western is over ought. If it did depend on epistemological defaults, it would not be a religion. It would be, it would be, it would be merely a belief system. You could call it a belief system, but it wouldn't be a religion. So this triad completely satisfies not only the epistemological history of the word religion, you can go back to Cicero, you can even go back to some of the, uh, I think, uh, you can go back to some of the fathers of the church. This triad completely satisfies not only that history of the word religion, but its meaning nearly across all of time. The synthesis of ontology and teleology produces axiology. That's religion. And that, that's, the, that's the technical way of proclaiming something to be religious. Just, it's very simple. The synthesis of ontology and teleology produces axiology. This is a truth. This is, it's not up for debate. This is kind of a de, de facto consensus in anthropology where religion is defined. There, there isn't any other place where religion is really defined other than anthropology. This definition um, of religion as a value-laden theory of man in the world that gives rise to duties of conscience holds univarially across all interpretational variations. So if you have a, do you have a definition of religion? And the answer is, oh yeah, maybe there, there, a lot of scholars disagree. 
Sure, yeah, they, they disagree. Most of them do, but they all agree on something. They all agree on this triad. They all agree that there needs to be an ontology and a teleology. And they all agree that when you have these things, what necessarily produces is an axiology, duties of conscience. So what is Marxism? You must understand that at the end of this here lecture, that Marxism isn't anything economic. This is unambiguously the truth. And it is the truth according to Marxists, okay? To be technical, Marxism is Gnosticism. It's Gnosticism because it believes it has special access to knowledge that isn't arrived at through, again, the epistemological defaults of reason, logic, deduction, inference, and correspondence. This is a faith system. Again, it's Gnostic because it has special, it believes it has special insight uh, in the order of being. When you apply this economically, when you dress it up in economic language, what you have is called class consciousness. It is a fundamental Marxist concept. It's a religious concept, but it's fundamental to Marx. And it's what makes his entire system Gnosticism. Now, Gnosis means knowledge. It specifically means insight. But it means insight that isn't arrived at, again, through the epistemological defaults of reason, logic, deduction, inference, and correspondence. If you have a special kind of insight to knowledge, or if you have this special knowledge and you didn't arrive at it through the defaults of epistemology, is it not religion? It is, not, it is, is it not faith? Again, the one of the fundamental pillars of Gnosticism is reception and revelation, or in other words, insight. This revelation or awakened consciousness, Gnosis, is central to the exegesis of the Marxist faith. Every time you, every time anybody thinks about Marx, you're going to be hearing, or you may be just thinking about class consciousness. Class consciousness is Gnosticism dressed up in economic language. And the entire Marxist faith is dressed up in economic language. And it's dressed up because he never actually finished uh, his, his works. His last works that he ever really, ever really published was uh, the first capital, or the first volume of Das Kapital, which is, which is um, economic language uh, hiding the fact that his system was completely faith-based. And he wasn't able to finish the second and third volume because it wasn't science. It wasn't economics. It was religion dressed up in economic language. Now back to the Gnosticism. Reception and revelation are key. Marx believed that people are able to have a special kind of knowledge, which is called class consciousness. Again, that's economic language for Gnosticism. Marx assumes that humankind is alien to himself, incomplete and estranged, but he possesses the ability to become complete through work, i.e. Marx's idea of self-creation. And this is in his economic and philosophical manuscripts, which is a religious tract, by the way. If you read it, you can, you can go and analyze it yourself. It's literally religion. It's also central to who and what Marx was according to scholars. Scholars don't care about Das Kapital and they haven't cared since it was ever published. Nobody ever talks about Das Kapital. It was almost immediately obsolete when it came out because it doesn't work. And it, it does such a bad job at hiding the fact that it's something else other than economics. Anyways, It's about understanding that there is a special kind of knowledge, class consciousness. This completion at the end of history, this unfolding is called socialist man. And what makes this process specifically Gnostic is that it is not, again, arrived at through the epistemological defaults of logic, reason, inference, or correspondence. Another thing about Marx, so that's the first thing, is this idea of class consciousness, which is the fundamental, 
one of the fundamental pillars of Gnosticism, that is reception and revelation, i.e. insight, right? That's the first idea that might suggest to some scholar that maybe Marx might be a little something more than just economics, right? The second thing that makes Marxism Gnosticism, and it's specifically esoteric Gnosticism, is anti-cosmic world rejection or the element of the speculative, right? Some people like Eric Vogelin call Marxism um, speculative Gnosticism, and he's right to say that. What he means by speculative is, well, first of all, it is, it is the second pillar, I would say, of Gnosticism is the idea of speculum, or the idea of looking in a mirror and back at yourself eternally. The point for Marxism, and you can read his works, is to ruthlessly criti criticize everything that is and to assume that what is wrong with the state of being is in fact the world itself. This actually is in fact Gnosticism. What thus chiefly concerns Marx and his Gnosticism is his ontology of man and his telos of history. That is, being in the world, I think what the Germans call Dasein. More specifically, who we are as human beings and where we are going, historically and spiritually. There is an aim to destroy the order of being which is experienced as defective and unjust and through man's creative power to replace it with a perfect and just order. Humanity's goal is to transcend this world through some special, again, esoteric gnosis. This is supremely reflective of the Marxist faith. I think the last thing about what makes Marxism, Gnosticism, and thus religion is something that's unbelievably obvious. And that is the immanentization of the eschaton, which is fundamental to the Gnostic faith. The purpose of Gnosticism in many ways is to come to terms with the fact that this world is not our home. And the point is to transcend this world through some type of special insight. Um, Marx, well, for Marx, I would say, reality must be destroyed. This is the great concern of Gnosis. More importantly, though, one must reproduce the independence of his existence by speculation, and that uh, this, it is, it is through absolute dependence, I would say, that he can be saved. This leads us to the last pinnacle of Gnosticism, that being the immatization of the eschaton, the need to produce heaven here on earth by achieving gnosis of one's incompleteness. It's one of the first things Marx wants you to come to terms with is the fact that you're incomplete. The purpose is to understand that you're incomplete. This is fueled by the spiritual force of self-creation, what uh, Marx called labor. This is achieved, according to Marx, by calling for the transformation of man at the fundamental level. Sometimes you can call this eugenics. In uh, Capital, he speaks of uh, the importance of producing fully developed human beings. He also says something along the lines of the full development of the human race, right? These words are pretty sketchy. The full development of the human race, it's, it shouldn't be the purpose of any kind of philosophy or any kind of religion, much less a philosophy, to assign a purpose for the human race. Much like Gnosticism, the, the Marxist faith requires you to believe in a complete solution and aim of human suffering, both suffering and existence, actually. Marx follows the thought of Hegel, who understood labor as the act of man's self-creation. Labor for Marx is a spiritual activity, not a commodity. That's important to understand. In summary, Gnostic movements are involved in the project of abolishing the constitution of being, specifically with its origin in the divine and replacing it with a world eminent order of being. Utopia is just another way, you could, another thing you could call that. In the, perfect, the perfection of all this, though, 
lies uh, in the realm of human action, what Marx called self-creation, what he economically called labor. This is literally the philosophy behind all Marxian discourse. So ask, your, ask the question, why is Marxism specifically Gnostic theology and not anything economic? We will appeal to the experts later, but in summary, in regards to why Marxism is Gnostic theology, all Marxian discourse believes that a change in the world Specifically, the order of being lies in the realm of human action. That's just obvious. That's that's number one right there. Another thing is the world is that which needs to be changed. That's it's fundamental to Marx. That's the anti-cosmic world rejection aspect of, Mar of Marx. Another thing is Marxian discourse. All of it believes in salvation from the world through special insight. That is extremely important. Again, the economic language for that is class consciousness. Another thing that is important about special insight is it isn't revealed, this special insight isn't revealed to you by the epistemological defaults of logic, inference, deduction, or correspondence. The purpose of Marxism in many respects is to achieve class consciousness. And this kind of insight, when you've achieved class consciousness, you have been imparted with a special kind of insight. And this isn't achieved, this isn't reached, again, through epistemological default. This is important. If it was, it wouldn't, we'd, we'd be much less inclined to call it a religion. It is not. And, and Marxist scholars say it's not. This is not my analysis, by the way. Lastly, Marxian discourse believes in the ultimate metaphysical solution to both human suffering and human purpose. That's just obvious. If, if, if there is a belief system, maybe it's science, but if it's a belief system that believes in the ultimate metaphysical solution to both human suffering and human purpose, no, that's not science. That's not economics. That's not social theory. That's religion. Um, you can read page 127 of Marx's Economic and Philosophical Manuscripts. You can read Eric Fromm's uh, book, who is a contemporary of Marx. Very intelligent dude. Raging Marxist, by the way. You can read his book called Marx's Theory of Man. Wow, I wonder what that's about. Huh, well, Marx had a theory of man that gave rise to his conscience. You can read, you can read Eric Fromm on that. You can read Hans Kelsing or Eric Vogelin, both arriving at similar conclusions. So, at least at this part of the lecture, you must understand that Marxism is Gnosticism. It's Gnosticism because it believes there is special insight, economically dressed, you can call it class consciousness. But even if you perfectly believe that class consciousness was everything to do with economics, which it doesn't, you still have the problem with the fact that class consciousness, even in the most economic sense, isn't arrived through the epistemological defaults of reason, deduction, logic, correspondence, or any of that. No, it's not. If, it's, if something is not arrived through those epistemological defaults, it has to be arrived in another manner. And it, what would it be if it's not faith, if it's not value-laden, right? If it isn't a matter of epistemological defaults, if it isn't a matter of reason, logic, or deduction, or correspondence, or validity, how else are you getting this special insight? Well, through religious means. It's Gnosticism. If just there was reason, logic, validity, if that were the means of achieving this insight, which it isn't, and it isn't according to Marxist's own mouth, then we would be much less inclined to call this a religious faith. The other uh, aspects of Marxism that make it religion are the other pinnacles of Gnosticism, such as the, um, the anti-cosmic world rejection aspect of Marxism. Marxism says on his last thesis, thesis of Feuerbach, I believe, that the point of society is not to understand it, but to, cha but to change it. 
What this means is that the point is to criticize everything and to understand nothing. In his esoteric vision, the point really is to transcend everything and to understand nothing. Marx says it himself. The point isn't to understand society, it is to change it. The point is to change everything, right? It requires you to have an anti-cosmic world rejection aspect. Again, the, the other thing is um, obviously the, the need to immunitize the eschaton, which is the idea of bringing heaven here on earth. That, that is one of the primary concerns of Gnosticism. And it is the dead-on concern of Marxism. The purpose of Marxism is to achieve absolute emancipation through some special insight. That special insight is class consciousness. Right? There isn't anything about this that has anything to do with economics. And again, it's not economics according to Marxian scholars. According to Marxian scholars who were themselves raging Marxists, this has nothing to do with economics. So getting the Gnosticism out of the way, what is Marxism? It's esoteric Gnosticism. It's speculative Gnosticism. Now, um, if I were to go over some scholars in terms of these facts, they're not going to be trivial scholars. These scholars are the most eminent scholars in the field. Um, these scholars, such as Eric Fromm and uh, Robert C. Tucker, right? But let's talk about those two people, actually. Robert C. Tucker, um, he writes... And in terms of Marxism as a religion, by the way. Well, I guess I would prelude more or less to saying that uh, when people think of economics, when they hear the name Marx, it is actually because they have not read Marx ever, not once, not a single word. We have learned that Marxism is not an economic theory, but a value-laden theory of man in the world. This is according to nearly all Marxist scholars, from Althusser all the way to Habermas. It isn't about economics, and it never was about economics. This is why his Das Kapital failed. He couldn't even write his own economic treatise. And what it is, is it's, it's an economic treaty, treatise. Um, it's, uh, it's religion dressed up as an economic treatise. That's exactly what it is. Um, but it should not be too interesting that the most readers in terms of speculative Gnosticism, would refer to Eric Boglin as a source that irrevocably proves my point here. Because the, the case that Eric Boglin makes uh, for Marx's religiosity is actually striking and still has yet to, uh, to be met with any substantial criticism. But I haven't really mentioned him much because he wasn't a raging Marxist, nor did he live the philosophy. And... Uh, as I have said, the best way to attack this comprehensive fatalistic philosophy is from the inside out. For this reason, I shall be briefly mentioning Robert C. Tucker, I guess, and Eric Fromm. Robert C. Tucker um, wrote a book called Philosophy and Myth in Karl Marx, right? And uh, Robert C. Tucker is not a trivial figure either. He is an eminent scholar of the Marxist faith in the 21st century, and of whom was actually, in fact, the very biographer uh, of Stalin himself. Anyways, he formulates the proposition that the religious essence of Marx is superficially obscured by Marx's rejection of traditional religions. And this is, I think, page like 20 uh, in his book, Philosophy and Myth, Karl Marx. So that's where the premise begins. The premise begins with the, that the, uh, the religious essence of Marx is superficially obscured by his rejection of traditional religion. Right? You want to talk about Marx as an atheist and all that stuff. We'll get into the common misconceptions that are vital to understand uh, soon, but one of them is that Marx is an atheist. He was not an atheist, and we'll get into that uh, shortly. Anyways, resting the book on this general claim that he writes, uh, he, he undergoes a further section called Hegel to Marx in the book, charting, charting basically the linear process of Marxian philosophy from Hegel's theology. 
the first part of this section, which is called Philosophical Revolts Against the World, is almost a perfect summation of Vogelin's The New Science of Politics, which is the book where he outlines what he believes speculative Gnosticism to be in terms of things like liberalism uh, and specifically Marxism. Uh, anyways, he charts the linear process of Marxian philosophy from Hegel's theology. So Hegel was a, one of Marx's favorite dudes. He was a theologian. And most of everything about Hegel is in Marx. Right? So Marx is Hegelian theology. Everything about Marx is Hegelian, with slight variations. And the slight variations has really much to do with dressing everything up as an economic theory. It isn't an economic theory. So the first part of, the, uh, of his book, and this is Robert C. Tucker, who is an eminent scholar, and a person who has lived the faith, right? He has lived the faith of Marx. He was Stalin's biographer. And, uh, I mean, you can't get any closer to Marxism than that, right? But anyways, uh, Vogelin, he, he makes an argument that is almost synonymous with Vogelin, and, and I don't think that they were working, they weren't working together or anything like that. Anyways, both conclude that Feuerbach, which is another, he's another Marxist contemporary, um, Marx's materialism was Feuerbachian. Um, and we'll discuss that in a bit. Anyways, they both conclude that Feuerbach is actually Hegelian theology incarnate, but only with the primary locus inverted. Man is God rather than God is man. That's the that's where you would arrive if you if you understood uh, Marx's idea of God versus Hegel's. And that's really the only distinction between Hegelian theology and Marxian theology. That is really the only big distinction is the inversion of their idea of the absolute. The point for both scholars, Robert C. Tucker and, uh, and Vogelin, is that man is God. Tucker writes, and I quote, thus Hegel's self-alienated God becomes Feuerbach's self-alienated man, and history as the process of God's attaining to full self-consciousness through man turns into history as a process of man's attaining to full self-consciousness through God. Instead of man being conceived as a self of the absolute, we have the absolute represented as a self of man projected into objectivity. Instead of God being divided against himself in Hegelian uh, knowing situation, we have man divided against himself in the Feuerbachian religious situation. A conscious subject contemplates its eternalized being as an object. The subject, however, is now refined as man. And the object before it in consciousness is God. So it's basically so what he's saying is the difference between Marx and Hegel, the, the, the theologian Hegel, really the, the operative main difference is the idea, the, the inversion of the absolute. Hegel believed that God was absolute, right? Man, or uh, Marx believed that man was absolute. And this is the only, so Marxism is a religious is the religion of man, right? That's the only inversion, and that's that was noted by Feuerbach, and uh, that was the Feuerbachian philosophy, was the inversion of Hegelian philosophy. It's still Hegelian philosophy, it's still Hegelian social alchemy BS. It's just only with the focal point of analysis has been inverted. So what lies at the center of the universe is man in the Marxian religion and not uh, God, and that's the only difference, right? So Marx is everything Hegel is, except for that inverted uh, fact. So that's important, because Robert C. Tucker explicitly calls Marxism a religion. Um, and uh, it's, not, it's not even like up for debate. If you read his book, the book is literally all about characterizing Marx as a religion. And this is one of the most eminent scholars of Marxism that has ever lived. And he's eminent also in the sense of not just his sheer amount of writings, but because he himself lived uh, Marxism. You couldn't get, you can't get any closer to living in Marxism and still being alive than being in Stalin's biography. Personal biography, I'd say. Um, but yeah, Robert C. Tucker had a few quotes too, if I may 
quote him. Um, capital, and I quote, capital is a, more, is a moral or even metaphysical treatise in economic disguise. Um, so Das Kapital, which is one of Marx's magnum opus, uh, Robert C. Tucker characterizes uh, Das Kapital as a moral or even metaphysical treatise in economic disguise. That, I mean, that's my point right there. We're not, we're not talking about economics. We're talking about something that is explicitly cloaked in economics. And it's cloaked in economic language. And this is why the Das Kapital, which is a three volume work, failed after the first volume. Mark, Marx could not finish it because it was all BS. You can't make it applicable to the economic domain, which is essentially science, right? Economic deals with hard data. It deals with facts that are not really manipulative or subjective, right? He wasn't able to do that. He wasn't able to apply his Das Kapital to the economic landscape because Das Kapital is all BS. It's religious, esoteric, Gnosticism, social alchemy BS. Um, but uh, I think another important quote with Robert C. Tucker, and, I'm, and I, as I've said, I've said I'm, I'm mentioning people who aren't on, who, who are not on my side, by the way, in all this. Um, I that are people who who have lived right the Marxist faith. Robert C. Tucker, I, I believe, used to be a radical Marxist and one of the most one of the uh, one of the mouthpieces for Marxism in the day. And then I think he converted when he decided, when he went to uh, Russia to become uh, Stalin's biographer, just the, the sheer amount of atrocities that he experienced because of this faith system, uh, I think converted him. And he became, it took him a while to leave the faith, but it, he became a, uh, in a sense, a classical liberal. Anyways, I'm mentioning these people. Um, I'm not mentioning people that I, particularly enjoy. I'm not mentioning scholars that I have an attachment to. No, these people are usually going to be raging Marxists, okay? And that just proves my point even further. Um, anyways, another quote that's important, and I'll leave it at this in terms of Robert C. Tucker, is an astonishing quote. Quote, an attentive reader of Marx quickly becomes aware of the intensely moralistic tone of his thought. Wow, there's another point that I just that that, uh, that is just proven there. Right? Marxism is religion. Again, Robert C. Tucker says so himself. An attentive reader of Marx quickly becomes aware of the intensely moralistic tone of his thought. There's a lot to be read uh, in terms of Robert C. Tucker uh, and his uh, philosophy. So, another person I'm going to mention is interesting because he was actually, in fact, a raging radical Marxist. He held up the faith like no other person has ever held up the faith. His name was Eric Fromm. He is a giant contributor to the Frankfurt School of Critical Theory, which we'll get into the next lecture. He is not a trivial figure. His writings are immense. His writings are influential. Not a trivial figure. So speaking of the numerous Marxist scholars, I would say that one is actually a particular interest, as he was explicitly instrumental in understanding and preserving the Marxist faith. This is Eric Fromm. And he was one of the leading experts in Marxian theory at the time. He was also a raging Marxist, and he died a raging Marxist. And leading experts in Marxian theory um, it was hard for them to convert. And any, Marxism, the idea of Marxism was so pretty, right? It suggested that the ultimate solution to human suffering was actually scientific, right? Obviously, it wasn't scientific. Everybody who has ever studied Marx, everybody, every Marxist has proclaimed that it isn't science. And in fact, most Marxian scholars who are attracted to Marxian are attracted to are attracted to Marx, are attracted to his philosophy because it isn't scientific, actually. They're attracted to his economic and philosophical manuscripts. And his economic and philosophical manuscripts is the only work that concerns a true Marxist. 
if you want to understand who and what Marx is, Marxism is, who Marx was, what Marxism is, you read the economic and philosophical manuscript. You don't read the Das, uh, or you don't read the Das Kapital or the Communist Manifesto. Communist Manifesto really wasn't much. It was very short. But das Kapital, you know, you, you would go to maybe the Das Kapital and read, uh, oh, oh, there's a there's a very large work, almost well, almost a little over two thousand pages of uh, Marx here. I wonder what he has to know. It's like no, that that crap wasn't ever published. It eventually got published, but not by Marx. It wasn't able to be published by Marx, right? You don't go to these things. You go to the economic and philosophical manuscripts of 1844. I think some, sometimes they call them the Paris manuscripts. This is Marxism. Any true Marxist concerns themselves with this. Um, and uh, this will become important when we discuss critical theory, because the advent of critical theory is fundamentally predicated on Philosophical and economic manuscripts, the economic and philosophical manuscripts of 1844. Anyways, it is important to mention people like Eric Fromm uh, and Robert C. Tucker. Uh, because, as I've told you, the best way to fight all this collective tribalism is to use their own material against them, attack them on their own terms. I would say that it works every time. Anyways, Eric Fromm wrote a book called. Marx's concept of man. And in this book, nothing becomes more clear about what Marxism is. It is speculative Gnostic theology. Whereas Fromm takes it, and I quote, a new and radical step forward in the tradition of prophetic messianism. Wow. Marxism, Marxism isn't religion? Okay. What's convincing about all this is that the entire book is based on the economic and philosophical manuscripts of 1844. Again, which, according to most Marxian scholars, is the most important writings of Marx in terms of depicting his philosophy idea and, and his ideas. So it is important to understand what Marxism is, um, what, come to terms at least with the fact that Marxism is something far more than economic. In the first chapter of Fromm's analysis called Falsification of Marxist Concepts, he explicitly states that Marxist, and I quote, Marxist's aim was that of the spiritual emancipation of man, end quote. Wow. Hmm. A few sentences later, he makes it very clear that there is an inherent religiosity in the Marxist worldview. Quote, Marx's philosophy was a new and radical step forward in the tradition of prophetic messianism, end quote. That is an important line. And this is coming from one of the biggest mouthpieces of Marxist uh, philosophy of all time, Eric Fromm. In chapter two, Fromm reaffirms the fact that Marxism has very little to do with the economic, but rather something imbued with value-laden moral imperatives. He says, I quote, first of all, it must be noted that labor and capital were not at all for Marx only economic categories. They were anthropological categories imbued with a value judgment which is rooted in his humanistic position. That's, you can't get more explicit than that. Labor is the act of self-creation. One of the points Fromm was making was that fact. Labor is the act of self-creation. And he was using the economic and philosophical manuscripts to substantiate his claims. Much later in the book though, um, in chapter six, I believe, called Marx's concept of socialism, he suggests that Marx does not fit the term atheist by writing, and I quote, Marx's atheism is the most advanced form of rational mysticism, closer to Zen Buddhism than are most of those fighters for God and religion who accuse him of godlessness. He, he literally just explicitly said that Marx was not an atheist right there. And that accusing Marxism of godlessness is a far-fetched uh, endeavor. I have to re remind you that this is one of the most decorated mouthpieces of Marxism in the world at the time. Eric Fromm is not a trivial person in Marxist thinking and was not only, in fact, instrumental in the development of neo-Marxism, but proves my point here uh, entirely. Marxism is a religion. This leads me, and we'll get a little more into the religious faith system, to uh, Common misconceptions 
of the Marxist faith. And these, I think, are most important in the uh, lecture today. Um, I think I'll start with history. One of the biggest misconceptions of the Marxist faith, of Marxian discourse, is the idea of history. There are many terms used in Marxist literature that have been hijacked and thus do not mean what common English parlance suggests. History is one of them, okay? And there will be a few other ones that I'll mention, but history is a big one, right? Everybody talks about uh, historical materialism, right? Well, the first part of that is history, right? History for Marx is not what is, but only that which is becoming. Again, as I've mentioned, Marxism is Hegelian theology. If you want to get technical, it's esoteric, Gnostic, Hegelian, social alchemy. History for Marx is not what is, but what is becoming. He did not mean history as what is meant by normal English definitions. You could say that which perhaps um, pertains to written record or that which is of past nature and existence, right? That's what history means, right? That's just common sense, and that's just what scholars say. No, Marx saw history as an unfolding cosmic force with man at its center. He saw it as the unfolding of being in the process of becoming. And it is only this process, this trajectory, that constituted any meaning of history for Marx. History for Marx is the sum total of human phenomena in the unfolding process of becoming. That is a very easy way to sum it up. Okay, that's Hegelianism. That's not economics. What the fuck? That's not economics. That's that's Hegelianism. Um, so remember that history for Marx isn't history. It isn't history in the sense of record or static facts. It's pseudoscientific, post-Hegelian, mystic, social alchemy, social alchemy BS. I mean. There really isn't any other way to put it. Um, anyways, that's that's one of the misconceptions of uh, the Marxist faith system, Marxian discourse. History does not mean history, okay? It doesn't mean history. This leads me to the other misconception, another misconception. There's many of them. I, th I think I'll just name a few for time's sake. This leads me to materialism, okay? Right? Historical materialism. Well, the first part of that is history. The second part of that is materialism. So following from this first misconception laid out is uh, Marx's idea of materialism. Marx was not a materialist. There it is, right there. Common misconception is Marx was a materialist. No, he was not. Marx was not a materialist. Marx himself says he's not a materialist. He was a dialectical materialist which is a unique mixture of Hegelian social alchemy, alchemy magic tricks with a Feuerbachian analysis um, of, uh, of uh, I would say, you could say history. Um, it's it's Feuerbachian materialism uh, mixed with a bit of social alchemy, Hegelian magic tricks, okay? Feuerbach's idea of materialism, materialism is magic in itself. Marx took that and injected it with some Hegelian social alchemy magic tricks, okay? What it does, um, Marx's definition of uh, materialism, which is dialectical, by the way, it's not materialism, is it makes history and its telos inseparable from the trajectory of material phenomena. That is the purpose, whatever that may be, of history and its material phenomena are one of the same thing. They are simultaneous to each other. This is not materialism. This is not materialism that has been espoused for well over 2,000 years. This is voodoo, <laughs> social alchemy, magic trick. Uh, it, it's an offshoot. It's an offshoot of what materialism is. It's a voodoo offshoot. Marx was not a materialist. Unlike traditional materialists, um, unlike, their, the, unlike the traditional thought of materialists, 
Um, this form makes cosmic moral imperative not only part of the process, but the process, right? Th this had nothing to do with traditional materialism. Epicurus did not inject a, um, a cosmic moral imperative to uh, the process of what he believed history was, right? To, move, to, or to put it more broadly, um, it is a system where the trajectory of human phenomena and its assigned theory of purpose, again, which is telos, that's the second hallmark for something that is religious, becomes consolidated into a co-eternal process, right? So he makes the purpose, whatever that may be, the process of history. So history and purpose um, from our, our co-contingent, co-eternal, they're one of the same substance, right? This is not materialism, okay? It is not materialism. I'm sorry, it's not. Bertrand Russell, I think, sums this up very clearly when he says, and I quote, his belief that there is a cosmic force called dialectical materialism which governs human history independently of human volitions is mere mythology. I can even quote from... Uh, Marx's economic and philosophical manuscripts. Marx specifically claimed, and when I said that Marx says that he himself is not a materialist, this is exactly what I mean. I quote, I deny the abstract materialism of natural sciences because it excludes history in its process and, pros and postulates naturalism over humanism. I mean, that you can't get more explicit than that, that Marx is injecting a value-laden theory of man into the process of historical phenomena. And he's making it one process, right? As I have said, that for something to be religious, there needs to be an ontology of man, which is a theory of man, right? Oh, go, just go back to Eric, or go, yeah, Eric Fromm's uh, Marxist theory of man, right? Does Marx have a theory of man? Yes, he does. There's an entire book on it. Go read the raging radical Marxist uh, Eric Fromm about whether or not Marx has a theory of man, right? He does, and there's an entire book on it by a raging Marxist, one of the mo most prominent mouthpieces for Marxism of the day, A.R. Fromm. Okay, so that's thing number one is he does have a theory of man. Marx believed, and it said right there, he specifically said that I deny the abstract materialism of natural sciences. I deny the abstract materialism of natural sciences. That's materialism. That's materialism that's been practiced for over 2,000 years. He denies that. He says he denies that. But he denies it because... And I quote, it excludes history and its process. What? It excludes history and its process? And postulates naturalism and humanism. The problem with materialism for Marx is that it postulates naturalism and humanism. In other words, it doesn't assign purpose, right? So Marx has a theory of man in the world. Marx has a purpose of history. What happens when you have those two things together? When you have those two things, you necessarily arise at axiology, duties of conscience, right? At that point, you have a religion. And um, this process, this triadic process, you could say, isn't contingent on epistemology, okay? That makes, I mean, that, that sums it all up. That's, that's a faith system, that is, that is a belief system, it is faith, it is religion. All right? This leads me to another misconception of Marxism, and that is religion, okay? This gets interesting, too. Um, so, religion is a big misconception in Marx, because everybody talks about how Marx was anti-religious, how he hated religion, right? Um, well, the misconception in that area of understanding is not, it is the modus operandi of why. The uh, method of operation, specifically of, in, in terms of hating religion. What was it specifically about religion that Marx hated? A normal person would say maybe it has something to do with the fact that religion is false. Right? That, that, that's usually a primary concern of 
atheism, whether or not religion uh, is false. But uh, Marx did not criticize religion for its epistemological approaches to reality, but uh, rather because it hindered the process of humanity's awakened consciousness of self-creation, what Marx meant by labor. Again, labor is a, again, is an economic term. It's a pretty economic term, but it doesn't mean labor. Which, again, his labor, the, the word labor in terms of the Marxian faith system comes from his Das Kapital. And again, as Robert C. Uh, as uh, um, Robert C. Um, oh, I can't remember his name. Uh, Robert C. Tucker. I'm sorry, I don't know why I remember. I'm not sure why I didn't remember his name. Robert C. Tucker says so himself. That Das Kapital is um, metaphysics dressed up at, in economic language. This is one of the words that's dressed up in economic language, or th this is the economic language, labor, right? What Marx believed, and this is from uh, Marx's obsession with Feuerbach, right? Was that nothing in the history of phenomena harnessed the human potential to such extremes as had the religious and transcendent. Religion is self-estranging in, in um, well, yeah, religion, you would say, in, in this um, uh, respect, religion was uh, self-estranging and self-alienated, right? You hear about Marx talking about how a person becomes self-alienated and self-estranged, right? Marx believed that uh, because nothing harnessed to such extremes the human potential, as did religion and the transcendent, that this estranged man from himself. And the point is to bring these extremes back into man, right? Because they're they're up in the ether somewhere, right? They're up, they're up in places and realms that don't exist, right? Like Judeo-Christian uh, um, religion and things like that, right? The point is to bring these extremes back into man. And Marx, in this respect, is actually absolutely right. Um, and he gets this from Feuerbach. Nothing has harnessed the sheer ecstasy of the human psyche and the productive potential, as has the transcendent and religion and the religions. This is this is a matter of fact. Being an atheist, though, for Marx, God is thus the essence of man. Man is God. For unto God, he projects his highest thoughts and his purest feelings. Marx thus interpreted the transcendent God, the Christian God, as the projection of what is incomplete in oneself. For him, the end of history arrives only when man draws this projection back into himself, when he becomes conscious. Again, that's gnosis, Gnosticism, that's class consciousness. When he becomes conscious that he himself is God, transconfiguration of man into absolute man as absolute being. This analysis of Marx is according to every Marxist scholar after Marx. Okay, this is just a matter of incontestable truth. This is what Marx believed religion was. He believed religion was the self estrangement of man. Because religion and the transcendent harnessed the productive potential and the extremes of the psyche, right? But it harnessed it in some ethereal place, right? You know, he wanted to bring that back into man, right? Instead of in some place, um, religion is self estranging and self alienated. Okay, that's what you have to understand about what Marx believed religion was, and. Uh, it was self-alienated and self-estranging because it confined these extremes to the realm of the immaterial and the ethereal rather than man himself, right? These extremes must be drawn back into oneself. In the religious and the transcendent, man has poured his highest thoughts and his purest feelings. This is a quote by uh, Feuerbach. Man has uh, poured his highest thoughts and his purest feelings. I would say that. I would say man has poured his highest thoughts and his purest feelings into his transcendent, and that there isn't any other force 
uh, that does the trick as the transcendent and the religious. Through religion and transcendent, all of art was created, all of music was created, all of architecture was created, right? This productive potential is what Marx and Furrier Barker are talking about. This, product, this productive potential, though, is what needs to be drawn back into man. And he believes that this is a process, and at the end of this process, which is what he called the end of history, man becomes God, right? Um, so it's very interesting because you can, you can call Marx and say that he wasn't an atheist, he wasn't a, uh, he wasn't religious. It's like, no, Marx was, was uh, very deeply religious, okay? Um, Anyways, uh, that the misconception in terms of religion. The, mis the, mis the misconception is this. Marx did not criticize religion because it had a problem with its relationship with truth. Marx didn't care about whether or not religion was true. Marx only cared the fact that religion caused man to be self-estranged, caused man to be divided against himself by confining or projecting the extremes into uh, the immaterial, right? That's what that's what concerned Marx when, in, in terms of religion. He didn't care about whether or not it's true. Right? An atheist's concern is whether or not religion is true, whether or not God is real, right? That was never the concern for Marx. It was, it was very different. Marx's concern was that religion kept from man his, his ability to become complete by confining his extremes to the immaterial. This is just, this is borderline eugenic and it's deeply religious. There, there isn't a question about it. Um, anyways, that is a very important uh, misconception. Again, that religion and Marx. Mo most people will think that Marx was an atheist that what concern for Marx is that, and people don't really understand what opium of the people, opium of the masses meant when Marx said it. What he meant is exactly what I've been saying, that it opiates you. It opiates you from becoming your absolute self. And it is the absolute self that Marx was concerned about, okay? That's just, that's religion. There's no question about it, but this is not, Misconception in terms of uh, religion is, is not uh, what you may think it is, such as uh, Marx hated religion. It's like, no, he didn't hate religion. He only hated religion in terms that it self alienated man from becoming his absolute self. It's extremely important. Um, anyways, uh, I think another worthy misconception is, is poverty. Right, namely that the aim of Marx's work was fueled by the contempt of economic conditions. And this goes along the lines of what I've been explaining about what he thought religion was, or what it, what it means, right? It was not material poverty that Marx saw as the basic tragedy of the workers under capitalism, but their stunted development and self-realization. And this is actually according to Eric Fromm, right? I think, uh, I don't remember what page, but he said something very long lines of that. He, it, what he cared about is the fact that people's development was stunted, right? Again, we can talk about eugenics and how this really qualifies as a eugenicist philosophy. We won't get into that, but Marx did not care for the poor, okay? He didn't. I mean, Marx lived in his mother's attic for his entire life. He didn't have anything to worry about in his entire life. He doesn't. He was also, a, um, by the way, Marx was a racist. He was also a um, anti-Semite, and he was misogynist. Okay, Marx does not reflect anything that's appropriate for today's society. And uh, so, what concerned him chiefly was the fact that capitalism divided and estranged one from becoming their complete selves. Right. This is why Marx is an anti-capitalist. This is why Marx is anti-religious. So as I've said, this goes a lot along the lines of what I just mentioned about religion. The two things that Marx hated were capitalism 
and a religion. And it isn't for any other reason other than it prevented people from becoming their Hegelian selves, their complete selves, right? Um, in other words, the, the religion and capital, capitalism, mask the true causes of suffering, which can only be realized and overcome through man's state of self-creation, right? So if you're happy because of capitalism, no, that happiness is false. And he called this false consciousness, which is another religion, religion term dressed up in economic language. Um, anyway, I think those are important misconceptions. So his idea of um, history as a process that has nothing, do, as a process, right? History has nothing to do with static facts. And this is explicit when you read Marx, right? That's important. History is a process of becoming. It's an, un, it's an unfolding process of becoming. This is magic, like an unfolding process of becoming. This is magic. This is what hi history was for Marx. It's interesting too, because Marx actually was not an, an economist. Um, he was a uh, moral philosopher. He didn't have any degrees in economics or science or really anything that he uh, proclaimed. The second, again, misconception is uh, materialism. Marx was not a materialist. And when you put historical materialism together, what you have is magic tricks. You have history as not a static uh, endeavor of reality, right? But an unfolding process of becoming. When you mix that up, when you put that together with materialism, um, which is a voodoo offshoot from what materialism is supposed to mean, uh, you have the very large section of the Marxist religious faith, right? So the second misconception is materialism, which is the second half of historical materialism, right? Uh, and uh, the misconception is that Marx was a materialist. It's like, no, he wasn't. Marx says he wasn't a materialist. Marx explicitly says, as in his economic philosophical manuscripts of 1844, that he is not a materialist. And he specifically, unambiguously says why he's not a materialist. And what he says is that he's not a materialist because materialism, as it is known, as it has been known for 2,000 years, divides purpose uh, with its trajectory, right? It removes the process of becoming and it divides it against purpose. There's no purpose to history is the problem for Marx, right? Again, as I have laid out that the definition for religion, there's a un there, there are universals to religion, and when those universals are met, you have a religion. And that is ontology, teleology, and axiology. Historical materialism is literally ontology and or ontology and teleology right there. The, the uh, what Marx meant by historical is the ontology um, of the aspect. In other words, it's a theory of man in the world. It's specifically a theory of man becoming. And uh, when you look at Marx's materialism, which again, he wasn't a materialist because he himself says he wasn't a materialist, right? You'll see that the materialism that he's putting forth, which is for Bakian materialism, is teleology. It's assigning purpose to the trajectory of material phenomena. That's what materialism means to Marx. And that's very important to understand. Yeah, I mean, people, are, people actually think that Marx proposed a scientific uh, situation for, pe for people to use in economics. He, they, they think that he proposed a scientific economic uh, model. It's like, what? what is materialism for Marx? It's assigning purpose to history, specifically to historical phenomena. That's not science, it's bullshit. I mean, his, uh, his third misconception, which is also important. So historical materialism is BS, by the way, and that's according to uh, eminent scholars in the field, that historical materialism is just absolute BS. And that's even according to Bertrand Russell, who wasn't really, um, into all this stuff, I'd say, but he was definitely a, a mark of our time. Um, historical materialism, um, 
according to Kalikowski, who was a, I would say that he was probably the most eminent scholar of Marxism of all time. And he wrote a, a very long work called uh, um, Main Currents in Marxism, which is probably the most seminal work in Marxism ever written. Um, but uh, his entire premise is the fact that Marxism is a religion. Uh, let me see if I can get a quote from him. Um, here's a quote, and I quote, this is Kalgowski, um in Main Currents of Marxism. I quote, Marxism is the greatest fantasy of the 20th century and a monstrous edifice of lies, exploitation, and oppression. This guy is the is at the forefront of Marxian scholarship um, and the universe. Another quote by him, and I quote, the influence that Marxism has achieved, far from being the result or proof of its scientific character, is almost entirely due to its prophetic, fantastic, and irrational elements. Wow. Hmm. Well, it's kind of exactly what I've been explaining here, is that Marxism is a prophetic messianic religion specifically of the Gnostic variety, because it requires you to criticize everything and understand nothing. And the point of criticizing is to transcend everything. Um, so, yeah, that, though, I suggest you write his name down, because he is phenomenal in his writings on Marxism. And he doesn't come from an ideological bent, by the way. He actually was, um, he used to be, Back in the day, a radical, radical Marxist. And he was proficient in his Marxism. He knew Marxism in and out, right? Uh, I think he eventually, though, uh, apostatized from the faith. And uh, I think that was, I think he wrote his book after his apostasy. Main Currents Marxism, write it down, look it up. It's one hell of a work, right? Also, look up uh, Eric Fromm's. Uh, book, Marxist Theory, Concept of Man, right? Seminal works, fantastic works, right? Eric Fromm was a Marxist, okay? So it's important to really know that the scholars that I'm citing are not on my side in any of this, right? And that just further proves that what I'm saying is not fringe by any stretch of imagination, not any stretch of imagination. What I'm saying is not fringe at all. In fact, Mark, Marx's own disciples are saying exactly what I'm saying. It's a religion. But it's the fact that it's a religion that makes it important, you must understand. Gary Gukach, who's one of the forefronts of critical theory, um, will, I will be explaining to you in detail what that is, is, uh, is kind of what he characterized Marx in a way that everybody characterizes Marx after him. So Kalikowski, for example, um, is known for having a Lukacian interpretation of Marx. And what that is, is completely uh, making Das Kapital obsolete, first of all, and completely focusing everything on his economic and philosophical manuscripts of 1844 and a few of, a few of, a few of his other works. Uh, but there's this idea that there's a new Marx and a, a mature Marx, right? Most scholars believe that there is no distinction. It's the same Marx all the way through, but you'll hear sometimes that there was, a, and the analytical Marxists will say this, that there was a mature, there was a, a, a young Marx and then a mature Marx, and that this matters. And, it, and in fact, it doesn't matter. And this, it doesn't matter according to leading scholars. Um, the uh, fringe movement, analytical Marxists, analytical Marxism, that movement attempts to remove the dialectical social alchemy BS because they come to terms with the fact that it's BS uh, and tries to make a Marxist uh, framework without that. And it's not possible to do that. That's the funny thing, which is why they're a fringe movement. They're extremely fringe. Nobody takes the analytical Marxist seriously anymore. Nobody, nobody ever did when they first became a thing. It is vital to the Marxist faith system to have his, his, the dialectical. The dialectic and uh, the analytic Marxists tried to remove this this uh, cosmic force out of uh, the Marxist faith, and it doesn't work. Marxism doesn't make sense without this, by the way. It doesn't, 
And so they tried to do this cheap trick and it never worked out. Anyways, Gary Lukács, one of the founders of critical theory at the forefronts of neo-Marxism, most of all interpretations of Marx are from a Lukácsian perspective. That is completely getting rid of, completely making obsolete Das Kapital, which is an unfinished, it's unfinished in the sense that Marx did not finish it, couldn't finish it because he couldn't apply it. He couldn't apply it because it was religion. He couldn't apply it because it was religion trying to apply itself to, a, to rigorous data like economics. It's like, you just can't do that. Anyways, interpretations of Marx, Robert C. Tucker, or sorry, not Robert C. Tucker also, but uh, um, who was I talking about? Um, Kalikowski, for example, that's right. His interpretation of Marx is completely through a Lukashian lens, and that's where it should be, honestly. You can't do it any other way. Anyways, uh, I, I, I implore you to look him up. That's K O L A K O W S K I, I believe. Um, and his first name is Lezek, which is L E S Z E K. Look him up. He's amazing. He's, his works are amazing. Look up Eric Foglin, B O E G E L I N. Um, look up uh, Robert C. Tucker, who again was the biographer of Stalin, who lived it. He lived Marxism in a way you can't, nobody else was able to live it. He lived it when Marxism was being applied. The deepest parts of Marxism, Marxism incarnate, was being applied uh, to economic territory, right? And that's obviously that led to disaster, that led to genocide, led to a whole bunch of stuff. He lived that, you know? So. Um, you can also look up people like uh, Ludwig von Mises, who is one of the most prominent intellectuals of the 20th century. Um, I think he famously said something along the lines that scientific socialism, which is dialectal materialism, uh, is the metaphysics. It is metaphysics and the promise of salvation, right? That, that, that's such an easy way to sum up Marx, right? I implore you to look him up. Him up. Uh, I also implore you to look up uh, people like um, Bertrand Russell, who is famous for quoting, and I quote, his belief that there is a cosmic force called dialectical materialism, which governs human history independent of human evolutions, is mere mythology. Right? Another important quote uh, by Bertrand Russell, and these are all people who are not fringe people, by the way, these guys are like at the forefront of uh, intellectualism, it's like these guys are unbelievably intelligent, they know what they're talking about. Another quote, and I quote, his purview is confined to this planet, and within it, or within this planet, to man. It has been evident that man has not the cosmic importance which he formally aggregated to himself. No man who has failed to assimilate this fact has a right to call his philosophy scientific. Marx professed himself an atheist, but retained a cosmic optimism which only theism can justify. That's just striking right there. End quote, by the way. That's amazing. That's Bertrand Russell for you right there. Um, so, uh, <clears throat> Eric Fromm's important. Ludwig von Mises is important. Robert C. Tucker is important. Bertrand Russell is important. Eric Boglin is important. Kalkowski is important. Um, these guys are not trivial scholars, and these guys all conclude that Marxism is little more than just economic. Okay, um, it is in fact has nothing to do with economics. And as I have said in previous uh, lectures, that it, it so happened to be economic because the environment demanded it. Economics just so happened to be the Focal point of analysis, focal point of analysis to perpetuate his theology. Okay, it has nothing to do with economics. It just so happened to have to do with economics in the sense that it was the economic that was of immediate concern. Right, people were dying of starvation. The amount of inequality in terms of financial assets and uh, people's standard of living was just absolutely horrible at the time. It was so. It, it's not economic at all. Okay, Marxism, and the proof that Marxism isn't doesn't have anything to do with economics is the fact that there's a thing called neo-Marxism, and neo-Marxism is 
a tool that neo-Marxists use is called critical theory, right? Critical theory began in, technically, it began a little before, but you could say it began in uh, 1923. Uh, and um, the proof that Marxism isn't economic is the word neo-Marxist. Neo-Marxism is everything Marxism is except for the economics. It, it, it's, it shifts the domain analysis to culture and identity, right? That's what neo-Marxism is. We're going to talk about that. And that's where it gets actually far more interesting than all this trash that I've been trying to explain to you guys. Um, it gets far more interesting than, in there because then you, you have a visceral understanding of Marxism because what I'll be explaining is society as you are living today which you're leaving, you are living in a neo-Marxist society. Um, but it's, this lecture was basically important to get you to understand that Marxism is in fact a faith-based system. And it's a faith-based system because of definitions, right? And uh, Benjamin Clemens, who I think was a chief justice, uh, again, establishes the definition of religion for establishment clause um, jurisprudence purposes, right? The separation of church and state, right? We need to have a definition of, of, of religion. If we're going to separate church and state, or if we're going to continue to separate church and state, we need to have some type of definition of religion. Ben Clemens defines religion, okay? His definition of religion is what prevails in American jurisprudence in terms of establishment, establishment clause and stuff like that. And for him, religion is a theory of man that gives rise to duties of conscience. That's that's what religion is for him. That's what religion is for establishment clause jurisprudence purposes, okay? That, it, that's nothing to do with divine agencies or supernatural or the superstitious. It has everything to do with just the theory of man and the universe, an ontology. Um, and I go back to anthropologists, though, who say that you need to have also, you know, there's the ontology, but you also need to have the teleology, uh, which is history for Marx, by the way. Um, Marxist concept of history is teleology. I mean, there's there, it's not up for debate. But you need to also have an axiology, and that's what Ben Clemens was um, was trying to emphasize that you need to have duties of conscience, because duties of conscience. Um, if you're going to impose duties of conscience, you're always going to be imposing someone else's duties of conscience, because not everybody live lives their lives the same way, right? And uh, so that's important. I began this lecture in, in talking about why religion ought never be ever a state matter or even a collective matter. It should always be an individual matter. Faith-based belief systems ought not ever be a collective matter or a state matter because what you'd be imposing, if, that, if it got to that point, is always someone else's belief system. And there's no way around that fact. Um, there's no way around that fact. If you're going to impose a belief system, if you're going to sponsor a belief system, if a collective is going to sponsor a belief system, if the, if the government is going to sponsor a belief system, if the government or the collective is going to sponsor duties of conscience, they're always going to be sponsoring someone else's duties of conscience or someone else's um, religion. This is the practical importance of why Marx should be defined as a religion. And uh, so that I kind of began with that and I kind of blended into why it is in fact a religion and why regardless of whether or not it's practically a religion is in fact a religion. And it is in fact a religion because it is Gnostic, first of all. It assumes that you, you have access to special knowledge, um, the economic language for that is class consciousness. And we're gonna to get to that in the next lecture. And that the point is to bring the extremes back into man through some type of, again, gnosis. And you have to realize that this is the purpose of your process in history. And you also have to believe that history is not history. History is the unfolding process of becoming. Okay, that's not, what, that's religion. Okay, um, it's definitely a value-based belief system. Okay, so you, you don't even have to call it religion. It is unambiguously a value-based belief system and that cannot be sponsored by law. That cannot be sponsored by a collective. 
there's always going to be someone else's belief system. As I've mentioned, not all people believe the same things. Not all people have the same ways of life. What needs to be applicable, what needs to be applied, what needs to be sponsored, if it is in terms of government, to legislative force or bureaucratic force or collective force, is something that is uniform. And uh, because then if, it, if, it, if that's the case, then it applies to everybody. And that's just what you call facts. Um, so it's important to take away from this, as I end this lecture, that Marxism has nothing to do with the economics. And this is according to Marxists. I mentioned uh, Eric Fromm. I mentioned Eric Vogelin. Uh, Robert C. Tucker, who all say the same stuff. It's not Robert C. Tucker and uh, Kolkowski and uh, um, uh, Bertrand Russell, Ludwig von Mises. Um, anyway, they're all saying the same thing. There's, there's, this has nothing to do with economics. There's something else going on here, okay? It's economic language. It's metaphysics dressed up in economic language. Anyways, take away from this lecture that Marxism is actually a faith-based system. You're going to be hearing a lot of people, at least the radical left. I mean, I mean I'm, I'm a leftist myself, but I, I revile the academic left almost, almost as I do ethno-nationalists. Um, they will be telling you that uh, Oh, there's there's a bit of science in Marxism. After all, he called it scientific socialism. There isn't a shred of science in Marxism. And the proof of that is science works. Science stands on its predictions. Nothing about Marx stood on its predictions. Everything that Marx attempted to predict failed. Everything. And, and the failures of Marxism is in fact, an entirely different lecture. The point is to take away from this lecture that Marxism isn't anything economic. It is, in fact, everything Gnostic. It has everything to do with a theory of man in the world. And that theory of man gives rise to the duties of conscience. It also involves, again, unambiguously, that a primary focus of Marxism is special knowledge, special insight. That's Gnosis. That's the first pinnacle of Gnosticism, that religion Gnosticism. The second thing, of course, again, is the anti-cosmic world rejection aspect of Marxism. Marxism requires you to live life as if the purpose is to criticize everything and to understand nothing. He says it so himself. All right. Um, another, actually, before I end that, there is another quote by Marx, actually himself, uh, in Economic and Philosophical Manuscripts. Oh no, actually no, it wasn't. I believe it was to a letter, a letter to one of his contemporaries. Um, I quote, I am, ref and this is when, when I'm quoting here, I'm talking about the second pinnacle of Gnosticism, uh, the anti-cosmic world rejection aspect of Gnosticism, the idea that what's wrong with the world, or what's wrong with the state of being is in fact the world itself. That, that BS, that's what I'm quoting here, okay? So Marx says, and I quote, I am referring to the ruthless criticism of all that exists. Ruthless, both not in the sense of not being afraid of the results it arrives at. Um, wait, ruthless, both in the sense of not being afraid of the results it arrives at, but in the sense of being just as little afraid of the conflict with powers that be. That says it all right there, that the point, the point of any type of being is to criticize everything and to understand nothing. Again, he says on his last thesis on Feuerbach, the point of society isn't to understand it, but it is to change it, right? We're going to get into the next lecture about what this means in terms of what we're living in today. It's praxis. Praxis is the idea of um, the idea of enacting the theory in reality, and that the enacting the theory in reality isn't separate from the theory itself. This is why it's BS when people say critical race theory isn't being taught in schools. Uh, it is being taught in schools because to, to um, the element of critical theory or critical race theory is critical theory. And it requires you to enact. So you can be talking about critical theory in schools, 
but they're actually doing it because doing it, um, critical theory is as critical theory does, as a famous James Lindsay would say, that there isn't, you can't separate critical theory from its process of enacting its uh, theory. It is being taught in schools, and it's actually being taught in schools according to critical theorists. Uh, Gloria Latson Billings, one of the most cited critical theorists in the world right now, um, have, has explicitly said that it's being taught in schools. Uh, and she's a raging Marxist, by the way. Again, one of the ways to fight this is just to, just to uh, cite people who are on the other side. I mean, uh, anyways, <clears throat> the second pinnacle of Gnosticism is to criticize everything, is to assume that the world that you live in is not your home, and the point is to transcend it. The point is to transcend it through special knowledge, class consciousness, right? Gnosis. Um, another quote, which is interesting, and I'm just about to end here, is uh, Marx had an obsession with uh, Goethe's Faust, and uh, Marx used to write poetry when he was like 23. He was known for the poetry at around that time. And uh, he was obsessed with a quotation, I think, uh, proclaimed by Mephistopheles in, in Goethe's Faust. And uh, the quote is simply, everything that exists, and I quote, everything that exists deserves to perish, end quote. Why would you be obsessed with a quote like that? And then, huh, lo and behold, analyze what Marxism is, and you, you see that the purpose of Marxism, one of the purposes, one of the primar primary purposes is to criticize everything, to transcend everything, to understand nothing, um, and criticize everything. The purpose, and we're going to be talking about critical theory in the next lecture. Uh, but uh, yes, the uh, the last the last pinnacle that you need to take away home is which makes uh, Marxism Gnostic is the idea that what's required by the faceism is to immunitize the eschaton, which is a religious term to produce heaven here on earth. Um, and you're not done until that happens. That's, that's another thing to understand. You have to go all the way. And uh, part of the process of this is realizing, coming to terms with the fact that you're incomplete. And when you're at this point, you've, you've achieved the consciousness. Um, you've, treat, you've achieved gnosis. But the purpose is to understand that you're incomplete, and the purpose is to become complete. And absolute, as absolute man is absolute creator in Hegelian lexicology. lexicology, lexicology. Um, but the, imit the immunitization of the eschaton, to immunitize the eschaton, is to produce heaven here on earth. Um, and it is the greatest concern for Marx. Um, it's the reason why everybody after Marx were utopianists. They, they wanted to produce utopia, and it doesn't matter how that was done, the purpose was to do it. That, that if your purpose is to produce utopia, in an unavoidable, imperfect world, you're a religious crackpot. The purpose of existence should not be to produce utopia. It should only be to progress. That is the only purpose, if you're talking about liberal um, uh, philosophy. The purpose is to progress. It's to move incrementally along the grains of uh, phenomena, along the negative grains of phenomena, but it is to do so incrementally. Heuristically, right? The fuck? A utopia? No. It, it, the purpose of, <laughs> in the liberal ethic, it's not utopia. And uh, so, but it, it's primary and it's central to Marxian dogma is utopia. The, per, the, the arrival of an imperfect, of, of uh, a perfect world. Um, and he speaks in his Das Kapital. Um, about the importance of producing fully developed human beings. Wow, that's eugenics. That shouldn't be the purpose of any type of uh, philosophy with legislative force. Um, but also that uh, uh, that man's necessity is to develop himself, the full development of the human race. The full development of the human race? What the hell does that mean? And I think that he says that in uh, full development of the human race, um, that's that's a verbatim sentence. Uh, I speak of the to 
to the full development of the human race. It's Das Kapital, uh, page uh, 554 to 555. The, uh, the goal is to produce a perfect, um, fully developed human race. It's like, don't, don't do that. That it, the only way you can do that is genocide. And that's not even going to do it. It's to assume that people are collectives. And that's, that's, I didn't really get into why Marxism utterly failed. One of the reasons why it, it, it failed is because by the way it does, just the way it does business, it's collectivism. It assumes that the collective is what matters. And there isn't any room for individuality if you're a Marxist. There isn't. It, it, it doesn't make sense. Individuals don't make sense in a Marxist framework at all. What's important is the collective. And uh, the problem with that is when you approach reality through the exclusive lens of uh, collectivism, what you end up doing is suggesting that collectivism is paramount above all. Collectivism matters more. But think, the collectives don't suffer. Humans suffer. People suffer. Collectives do not suffer. And that's your biggest fatal flaw right there. If you're assuming that the primary way to look at reality is through a collectivist lens, that's the first ingredient of genocide right there. Because all you have to have is someone to disagree, one person to disagree. The locus of suffering is at the individual level. It is never at the collective. And that is your biggest mistake to think otherwise. Human or people, um, individuals existentially suffer. And the point is they existentially suffer. Collectives do not, and they never will. Um, so Marxism is anti-individualistic. That's one of the reasons why it utterly failed is because the Western ethos is fundamentally predicated on individualism. The liberal ethic, the liberal order is fundamentally predicated on individualism. Uh, and uh, so it, it didn't work, and it wouldn't work, and it doesn't work, or because one one of the things is because of that. And uh, so it's important to understand that Marxism is actual fatalistic. It's actual fatalistic tribalism. It assumes that the only way to approach reality is through a zero-sum fatalistic lens of power dynamics. That that is the only way a Marxist approaches reality, and there isn't any other way to approach reality in any other way. Would it be Marxist? Um, so, yes, it's it's a it's a disgusting, horrible way to look at reality, and it, it assumes that every all of experience it, it assumes on the onset that all of experience can be reduced down to zero sum uh, conflicts, and uh, we'll. I'm going to be explaining what that means in terms of today's society. As you've noticed that everything nowadays seems like a zero-sum Hobbesian battleground of identity groups, of identity categories, of victim uh, paradigm, right? Everything seems like a zero-sum Hobbesian battleground, right? Well, that's Marxism, okay? Uh, we'll be discussing that later. Anyways, those misconceptions are, are very important. The importance in characterizing Marxism is a Gnostic faith belief system, not because of uh, of practical purpose, but practical purposes, but because it is actually factually the case that Marxism is Gnostic. It believes in a special kind of knowledge that isn't arrived at through normal epistemological means. That's Gnosticism. Again, it also believes in the that the purpose is to eminentize the eschaton, to bring heaven down here on earth, to produce a utopia in a necessarily imperfect world. That's a fatal mistake, right? And then, and this is just generalized, this whole lecture is a generalization of Marxism. I'm not really even getting deep into the Marxist faith system. The other thing is the anti-cosmic world rejection aspect. You have to criticize everything. You have to assume that the purpose of moving forward is to criticize everything. And the purpose isn't to understand anything. And Marx says that himself. Those three things right there uh, characterize it as 
uh, Gnostic because of definitions. So it's not even really up for interpretation. It's not really up for debate. It is a matter of bedrock fact that Marxism is Gnostic theology. And even if it weren't Gnostic theology, for some magical reason, it's still Hegelian social alchemy BS. Uh, and again, it establishes, you, you, can, you can even almost take away that. You really couldn't, but let's say you could. Marx still believed that history was uh, the process of becoming. And he believed that uh, materialism was the uh, assigning theory or assigning purpose to phenomena and its trajectory. Like that's, you don't do that and call yourself a scientist. You don't do that and call yourself um, a social theorist, right? Karl Marx wasn't either of those. He was, an, he was a Gnostic theologian dressed up as an economist. Uh, and uh, that's just, yep. And I think that's really where I leave off now. If you can take away, you can go home and take away uh, some fundamental facts, the misconceptions of his idea of history. Marx did not mean history. Misconception um, of materialism. Marx was not a materialist. The misconception that Marx was an atheist. Marx was not an atheist. Um, there's a distinction that's important to be made in, in, in those terms that uh, one can still be an atheist, but not secular. Right, the, the Stalinist regime, for example, the Pol Pot regimes, uh, all the Marxist regimes, the countless Marxist regimes, though sometimes they enforced state atheism, that doesn't mean anything. They weren't secular. They were dogmatists. Secular means without dogma. So the, there's a religious right trope uh, they think they have an upper hand by suggesting that Stalin was an atheist and Hitler was an atheist, though the, the Third Reich was not atheist, it was Catholic, by the way. That uh, Pol Pot was the atheist, that Lenin was the atheist, and that they enforced state atheism, and they think that they have a point. It's like, okay, cool, they enforced state atheism. They were still not secular. I don't, anybody who is concerned with liberalism doesn't care about atheism, they care about secularism. And uh, so, yeah, their point is, Dennis Prager is one of the is one of the asshats who likes to pull that out. And like, oh, you got a point. It's like, okay, cool. You obviously don't know the dis distinction between secularism and atheism. Anyways, there's anything that you, if there's anything you're going to take away from this lecture, it is that Marxism is not economics. That Marxism has nothing to do with economics. That Marxism is, in fact, a theory of man in the world that gives rise to duties of conscience. And that is not my analysis, my analysis of things. That is just what Marxism is. And it's what Marxism is according to Marxists. Anyways, the next lecture will be about critical theory. This is the first lecture in the Marxification process of the American you could say Western ethos. Next lecture will be about critical theory. What is critical theory? We'll be talking about the Frankfurt School of Critical Theory specifically, and that the, what the Frankfurt School of Theory was, was a response to the utter failures of Marxism. And the school was responsible for a paradigm shift that, uh, was responsible for, responsible for shifting the domain of analysis away from the economic and the uh, and class, which was the problem with Marxism, right? Everything after the economic philosophical manuscripts, the Das Kapital was all about economics, quote unquote, which is why he never published it because he, he didn't know how. What happened was this paradigm shift, shifted the domain of analysis away from the economic away from class and into the domain of identity and culture. This is a matter of fact, and this is not a right-wing conspiracy theory. This is something that you arrive at if you read English and if you read Marxists, specifically George Lukács and um, Tony Gramsci. Tony Gramsci. Um, you could say that they produced the 
an efflux of works that were almost single-handedly responsible for this paradigm shift. Right? This paradigm shift is called neo-Marxism. Prior to neo-Marxism, right, it supposedly had things to do with the economic, right, which is why it failed. It failed because it required to stand on its predictions. When you switch the domain of analysis to culture and identity, you don't have to stand on your predictions because identity and culture are um, products that are not rigid. They're malleable. They're up for interpretation. They're subjective. Class and economics are static categories. They're not rigid. Or they are rigid. They are quantitative. They're not qualitative. That's why Marxism failed. Well, if you want Marxism to succeed, if you're a raging fatalistic Marxist, if you want it to succeed, just switch, switch the domain of analysis to, uh, switch the, um, the Marxian domain of analysis to uh, culture and identity, and you win the game. And that's what happened. The tool for doing that is called critical theory. We'll be discussing that. It's going to get very interesting. Gergi Lodge and Antonio Gramsci are the ones responsible for that paradigm shift. What is that? What happened after that paradigm shift? What is it? It's neo-Marxism. That's what this is. It's neo-Marxism. Neo-Marxism is Marxism without the focal point of analysis on economic and, uh, and class. And that's all it is. It's literally everything Marx is, except for the fact that the domain of analysis has been shifted. That's it. Anyways, that's what we'll be uh, explaining uh, the next lecture.